Hey everyone, it's Oakley, and a ton of news articles just dropped for Total War 3 Kingdoms. There's about five different articles that I've been kind of pruning through, trying to find out key bits of information, and then coalescing them together. So this is going to be the first of several videos where we take a look at different aspects of what we've learned. So this principal video here is going to be discussing heroes, what we know about them. So the main things that I've picked out are going to be the different hero types, a new hero satisfaction mechanic, known as Guanxi, uh, the hero items and quests, hero recruitment, and then hero unit formation unlocks. Uh, there'll be more videos on battlefield duels and sieges, but for now we're going to focus primarily on just the heroes themselves. So from PC Gamer, we basically know, or at least they state, that the heroes in the game are going to be based off 11 warlords from the era, and they're going to be paired with some special abilities, passive debuffs, and buffs, etc. But basically confirming that 11 seems to be a magic number here for these big characters. So this could perhaps coincide with the fact that maybe there's 11 different playable factions or ones with big, almost the equivalent of legendary heroes. Um, but this is pretty vague. I haven't seen anyone else um, confirm the total number of playable factions. Next, if you look at the Eurogamer article, they actually state that there are a plethora of name characters and that there's apparently over a thousand of these. So what that means is there's going to be different tiered commanders, there's going to be the main ones, probably the ones that we just mentioned that are 11 warlords, and then there's the latter type which is going to be going to be your lower tier commanders which are going to have over a thousand different names to them. So those are going to be your kind of tiers, kind of like how you'd see a legendary lord and then a hero in Warhammer. So I'd expect to see something along those same lines where each is going to have kind of buffs and debuffs and its special abilities, but I would expect the you know the top tier ones, the Lu Boos, the uh, Sao Sao ones to have a little bit more fleshed out uh, abilities and depth to them, and particular resonance perhaps with their own faction. So that's kind of setting it up. Now continuing on, they do say that generals are going to have their own subclasses. So they thus far have only stated two different types. I assume there's going to be more. But the ones they did state that are in existence are going to be the strategist and then the guardian. So again, as I said, there'll probably be more. But the strategist, they say here, grants various active and passive buffs for your units. And they're uh, you know, obviously going to be more of a support role in that case, buffing up, making your whole army work a bit better. Whereas the other one is going to be the Guardian class, and this is going to be a more combat-oriented general, they say, which essentially turns them into a hefty tank capable of taking huge amounts of damage, which will then use to plug gaps in the breach. So this is going to be interesting. Not only do you have you know, high-level lords, but then you have the lower-class lords, but then even within that, you have different subclasses, which is where they can fill different roles and get fleshed out to different abilities. This is really awesome, uh, and this is what they state in the Eurogamer article, is that it's going to be especially key going into battles to not only um, essentially pick the right army build and composition, but also pick the right hero build that can counter the enemy. So if the enemy is going all you know, uh, tanky lords, and they can perhaps on the battlefield all gang up, that's something you're going to want to find a way to address, uh, either with your army composition or your own lord composition. So I really like how this adds another uh, a lever to pull, uh, and another aspect of the tactics. Now, these characters are not only going to be in the battlefield, but they're also going to be obviously in the campaign. So let's talk next about a new mechanic that they're going to be introducing. I've seen it vaguely kind of talked about as the satisfaction mechanic. Uh, one of the articles from Your Gamer actually uh, stated that this was a Guanji mechanic, which is basically a sense of connection, relationship, or reciprocity. Essentially what it alludes to is it's kind of like a way to represent the loyalty of your lord, but it's a bit wider than that. The PC Gamer article states that it basically introduces heavier social dynamics between the lead characters. So essentially what this means is each character is going to have their take on where they are in life. They're going to have opinions on where they stand within their faction, uh, their relationship to other leaders, other generals, etc. So it's all going to be pretty dynamic. Uh, in the Venture Beat article that I found, they said that characters will build their own friendships and rivalries based on what's happened in previous battles and that this in turn will impact the conversation system. So that's the first I hear of a conversation system. I don't quite know what that is. It could perhaps be something tied to general speeches. It could be something uh, like when you go to the diplomatic menu, the automatic greeting that you get when you talk to someone, or it could be another system entirely that's perhaps, perhaps tied to, uh, sorry, tied to the, uh, the dual mechanic, which we'll be talking about in a, in a separate video. But yeah, that's all interesting. So as a brief little description here, um, in that VentureBeat article, what they say is, um, 
If warriors have clashed before, they may come out with great respect for each other. I fought Lu Bu, and they say this in quote, so a character presumably might deliver these lines. I fought Lu Bu. He's a great warrior. I respect him because of that. And then the next time the character meets him, he'll speak to him more respectfully. Or it might be, quote, this guy is disloyal. I hate him. I'm going to try to get over, uh, get one over on this guy, end quote. So those are rough approximations of the dialogue lines. But it gives you a sense of how they're trying to have players play off each other, which is going to be great because that really mirrors uh, the tone and the, the, the character setups that you see in the Romance of the Three Kingdoms novel. So that's all really interesting. Uh, I love to see how it plays out. Uh, next thing uh, in, pertaining to these specific warriors and how you might customize them. So we already talked about classes. Another thing that we would come to expect from something like Warhammer would be you know, specific item unlocks. So they do clarify that here um, they're going kind of a half step step towards Warhammer. So there are going to be items that you can collect. So for instance, Lubu can get his ultra fast horse red hair, uh, and that items can be now looted by killing enemies. So for instance, if you were to defeat Lubu, you could then gain his horse. So that's kind of nice. They're adding these weapons and perhaps armor that you can loot from people, but they go on to say that there are no specific quests to get these. Uh, as you might expect in a Warhammer title where Carl Franz has to get Galmaraz, etc. So they're saying, you know, there will be items that can trade hands, but it's not going to be an explicit quest chain to go unlock it in some weird mountain or to do something. Now, that doesn't exclude the fact that it could perhaps be the result of a specific event chain, um, where, you know, maybe you spend money uh, uh, to, to, to bribe another person, or you give them a special sword to gain their loyalty, and then that sword now is generated in the game and gives them buffs, etc. And that's essentially how red hair was given to Lu Bu to gain his loyalty. Um, so yeah, that's going to be represented, but uh, it's kind of nice to see they're not going to go all the way with it, as I said, with the quests. Now, another important thing with heroes is going to be um, how they're reworking kind of the recruitment mechanism behind them. So let's touch on that. So moving on to this, uh, heroes in the battlefield. So they're restructuring what it means to have an army. So in the battlefield, it's pretty cool. They're changing it such that it revolves around what they're calling these retinues. And what that means is that when you go into a battle, you have the option to choose up to three different hero units. Each hero unit or commander is going to be in charge of their own retinue. So instead of having one big army bar at the bottom, it's going to be split into up to three different ones. And each one is going to have its own commander. That commander uh, kind of has synergy with those specific forces. So on the campaign map, they said that that commander can recruit exclusive units and gives units of their specialized type certain buffs and bonuses. So that's interesting. So basically you'd expect, you know, you'll have your probably long range commander who on the campaign has special access to certain archer units. You'll have another commander who's probably good at cavalry. So you'll bring him and he can recruit special high attack or quick moving cavalry units. Uh, and that's going to be really interesting, a really drastic change up of how recruitment works and just really emblematic of the time period where you'd have, you know, the splintering of the centralized authority, everyone's kind of collecting their, their local warband around them, and then they coalesce into these coalitions in different areas where each one brings their own little contingent to the force. So this is really awesome. I'm very excited for this. Uh, also, another thing that was mentioned here is in the U.S. Gamer article, and I think people haven't picked up on this yet, but they also said that... Uh, Dogbert was hinting at hybrid units in the game and that you might actually be able to see a spearman that's also an archer kind of like the Lothurn Seaguard uh, so that would be something that is specific to like certain commanders so you could get maybe like the straight up cavalry commander or perhaps there's like a hybrid commander who has cavalry and range so you'd get mounted archers all kinds of things like that that make it really interesting that will make you you know you're not just unlocking a special building and teching that building up to finally unlock that unit uh, as we've seen in previous games, instead what you're doing is you're saying, I want this specific unit, this specific unit is uh, recruitable by this specific lord, and now I want to win that lord over to my cause. So there's a completely different recruitment line to get at special units. It's all going to be about that Guanji uh, system that we talked about, the satisfaction faction mechanic where you want to interact with that in order to get at that commander, in order to get at that special unit. So that's all very cool. Another thing as well is that uh, they're not only applying this kind of uh, lord connection to recruitment, but they're also going to be tying it to uh, formation unlocks. So apparently, uh, by default, you will get very limited or no formations at all for your units in the army. But then when you bring certain general types, especially the high-level strategist type um, commanders, 
you'll actually be able to de deploy formations. And so that general will use their knowledge, train up their troops, and anyone within their control will then be able to enact that ability. So they gave examples of a diamond formation for someone who's good with cavalry. Uh, it's not clear if that will apply to just the forces in the retinue or the entire army. My assumption is it's just whatever retinue is directly under that commander. Um, so yeah, this is all really cool. I love the restructuring of kind of the unit recruitment and this. Uh, it's just going to make it all synergize around the characters, which is you know, the only real way to to do Romance of the Three Kingdoms any justice is to make it all about the characters and the dynamism and the, uh, you know, the, the gravitational pull around them. So I'm all very excited for this, but it does leave some pretty open questions about, okay, if armies are no longer really generated around, like, you know, single stacks, but instead are coalitions, what does that mean on the campaign map? Are we now going to have a bunch of little smaller, uh, you know, one-third army size forces running around and then when there's a battle you can like pluck up a couple of them and turn them into an army how does this work um that's something that has yet to be seen but for now that's going to be it for my video covering the heroes uh their types we went over the satisfaction mechanic we went over the items and quests we went over recruitment and then unit formation unlocks in the next couple videos i'll probably have a video that's going to be covering the battlefield duels because that's an interesting mechanic that they've introduced and then we'll do another video probably discussing sieges and what we know about it so far so that's it for this video. Hope you guys enjoyed. Stay tuned for more, and I will see you in the next one. Peace out.